Good evening, everyone. My name is Jennifer Harville, and I'm with the Tug Hill Commission in Watertown, New York. On behalf of the Constable Hall Association and the Tug Hill Commission, welcome to part two of our webinar series called The Constable Chronicles. This series explores the life of the Constable family and Constable Hall, otherwise known as the Jewel of the North Country, from a personal perspective with facts, some fiction, and family lore. Part two, the Constable family and everyday life in the 1800s, focuses on the people living at the Hall in the 1800s in their everyday life on the estate. A little housekeeping. First, you're all on mute to reduce background noise, but if you do have questions, use the chat box and we'll answer them at the end of the presentation. The webinar is being recorded, recorded and will be posted to our website when we're through. And finally, pay attention. There will be a three question quiz at the end of the presentation. So there will be three chances to win the book, The Constables, First Family of the Adirondacks by Edith Pilcher. I would like to introduce your speaker for the evening, Martha Constable Murray. Marty is a retired English teacher and she is the daughter of John Pierpont Constable Jr. who is the last Constable family member to own the hall. Her book, Constable Hall, A Story is available at the Hall gift shop. Peter Hayes, the curator of Constable Hall, will also be joining us towards the end of the webinar to help answer your questions. And now, without further ado, here's Marty. Thank you, Jennifer. And thanks again to the Tug Hill Commission for partnering with us for this series. I'd like to welcome back those who joined us for Chronicle One and a very special welcome to those who are joining us for the first time. As mentioned, Chronicle 2 is uh, the, the second in our series, and I am the sixth generation descendant of William Constable Jr., who built Constable Hall in Constableville, New York. Your verbal and visual tour tonight will chronicle the owners of the hall in the 1800s and what life was like living there. And yes, I promise some facts, some fiction, and some family folklore. And as Jennifer mentioned, hang around. There will be that quiz at the end. And this time we've upped the ante for the prizes, but more about that later. So are you ready? Let's get going with a little water music. That's what the fountain would found like if, uh, sound like if it was running this time of the year. So who am I? Well, again, I'm the, of the sixth generation from William Constable Jr. who built Constable Hall. If you count, you'll see that there are seven generations listed here. We're gonna talk about that, that William Constable Sr. in just a few minutes. My dad was the last one that owned Constable Hall and he actually lived there. So William Sr. was father of William Jr. and William Jr. was the one that built Constable Hall. When his father died, he inherited 10 to 20,000 acres of New York State in 1803. His son, John Constable, um, was my great-great-grandfather. And his son, James, was my grandfather. My, uh, my great-grandfather, I'm sorry. John Pierpont Constable Sr. was my grandfather, and you'll recognize the Pierpont name as uh, if you've driven up Route 81, you see Pierpont Manor, the constables and Pierponts intermarried. John P. Constable Jr. was my dad, and I am one of four siblings, all of whom are living, uh, and most of them in Northern New York. What we're going to talk about tonight are the people who owned Constable Hall in the 1800s. William Jr., upon his death, left the hall to his wife, Mary Eliza McVicker, Constable. Upon her death, their son John inherited the hall, and upon his death, his son Casimir inherited the hall. When Casimir passed away, his wife Jenny became the owner. So we're going to be talking about those three tonight, and in the webinar three, we're going to be talking about the remainder um, of the family owners. 
So let's take a look at William Constable Sr. first. As the dialogue shows you, he was a fur trader, born in Dublin, Ireland, came to the United States after living in Canada for a bit, and he settled in Schenectady. Once he uh, was old enough, he moved to New York City, and that was where he started trading uh, between New York City and Detroit as a fur trader. During the Revolutionary War, he was the aide-de-camp to the Marquis de Lafayette, and they remained lifelong friends. Actually, I'd read a recent account of when, after William's death, when the Marquis visited uh, William's wife, and she said he was only there for about 15 minutes, but it was a wonderful experience to see their lifelong friend again. If you're not familiar with what an aide-de-camp is, aide-de-camp is, is pretty much like an administrative assistant. William also was a commercial trader, and when he moved to New York City, he owned several large ships, and the, the map that you see at the left is a map uh, of uh, the, from his book, The Empress of China, and that was one of his big ships that traveled between New York and China. He actually brought trade from China to the United States. He sent lumber and ginseng to China, and they brought back, surprise, tea. He made really good money doing this. It, however, it was extremely dangerous because of war and pirates. William also was a land speculator and he was, this was one way to diversify his business holdings. He had many land purchases, but the biggest one he was involved with was the Mac uh, Macomb purchase. And he was in partnership with Alexander Macomb and Daniel McCormick for that purchase. What he did with the land that he purchased was he took, he went to Europe and sold those tracts of land to people in Europe. William died in 1803 at the age of 51. We have several of his artifacts at the hall. On the left-hand side of the screen is a buckskin jacket. Uh, it hung for many years uh, on the back of the door at the, at the veranda, and it's believed to have been given to him from the Iroquois tribes. Probably in the 1770s, he was very friendly and kind to them. The decoration on it is actually done with porcupine quills. The desk on the right-hand side is his traveling desk, and when he went to Europe, that desk folded up and he took it with him. But even more significantly, on the top of the desk is an eagle paperweight. And that was a gift from a friend of his who was also his lawyer for all of his land dealings. You might recognize this man's name, Alexander Hamilton. For those of you who joined us the first time, do you recognize these folks? Yes, you do. This is William Jr. who built Constable Hall and his wife, Mary Eliza McVicker. William was 17 when his father died, and that was when he inherited all those uh, acres. And his uncle James was appointed as his guardian, as was his brother-in-law, Hezekiah Pierpont. As a young man, William actually had a chance to travel with his uncle James and Hezekiah, uh, to visit some of the land that he inherited. They did this in 1806. They went to see the North Country and uh, they traveled for approximately 32 days and they traveled about 572 miles. William graduated from Union College in 1808, two years later, and then he took over his land holdings. He also uh, received a little bit of an income from a family estate in Ireland. As mentioned, he married Mary Eliza McVicker from the important and very prominent McVicker family. And they were married in 1810. William was 24. The lamp that you see at the right was a gift from the M McVicker family honoring their marriage. Now, William was the one that built Constable Hall. And he built it on land in what was then known as Shalerville, which was named for Nathaniel Shaler, who uh, actively sold land for William Sr. 
for about 10 years before William Jr. arrived. From 1810 to 1819 and 1820, William spent most of his time on the construction of the hall, but he also helped found the local church and the school. If you recall, he, he was injured during the laying of the capstone at the portico and he died early at age 36. He left Mary Eliza and five children in Constableville. Let's talk a little bit about Mary Eliza McVicker. Mary Eliza's family were wealthy New York City merchants like the Constable family. Her father, John McVicker, was a good friend of William Sr.'s and three children from each of the families intermarried. The McVickers were well-educated and prominent and they eventually lived in Bloomingdale, New York, and that was the name of the beautiful mansion that you see here on the left-hand side. Originally, William Sr. owned this Bloomingdale home as his summer home. And today, if it still existed, it would be in Midtown Manhattan. Later, William Sr. sold Bloomingdale to Mary Eliza's father, John. Now, Mary Eliza received an education beyond just how to do domestic kinds of things. And this was helpful to her later on when she had to manage the hall after William Jr. died. Actually, the hall has her lesson books, including this lesson on vulgar fractions, actually the reduction of vulgar fractions. So what's a vulgar fraction? Well, vulgar in Latin means common and in math, it means, a vulgar fraction means a fraction with a numerator and a denominator, but it's not a decimal. Mary had uh, two brothers, James and Edward, who settled in Lewis County, and actually they were prominent in county affairs for approximately 100 years. So as a widow at 33, Mary Eliza found a way to raise her five children at Constable Hall. The children were aged between one and 10 when William died. Originally, she used the hall as a summer home, but eventually she stayed there permanently. And her personality, well, she was born and raised in New York City. So she was educated and reserved, and some might actually use the word a bit snobbish, class conscious as she didn't really associate with the people in the village but she was very kind to the neighboring Oneida Indians. We have some artifacts of hers at the hall, most specifically her stirrups are on the left-hand of the page here. And she rode and took her constitutional almost every morning. On the right-hand side, you'll see the arrow that points to the long rifle over the fireplace in the kitchen. And that rifle was uh, I should say firearm, that firearm was loaned to the Oneidas when they hunted in the area. And if you remember, we talked about the Indian room in Chronicle 1. Across from the kitchen is the Indian room where they, would, where they were allowed to stay after they hunted and, and they had a warm place to stay. Mary Eliza was very devout and one of the first renovations to the hall was to add a chapel for her. The old Episcopal church, and when I say old, um, it, it's no longer exists, but the old Episcopal church was approximately a mile away from the hall at Payne's Corners. And during the winter, it was difficult to get there. Plus remember, Mary Eliza didn't really associate with the townspeople too much. So she had her own little private chapel added there so that she could worship. Mary Eliza did donate land for the new Episcopal Church in 1835. And you'll see a picture of that a little bit later on. That church still exists and actually I had relatives who were married there. The gold dove from the old church pulpit actually is on display at Constable Hall. So the old church site became the Constable Cemetery. Uh, and it's not the Constableville Cemetery because that's a separate cemetery. This was called the Constable Cemetery. There are people other than the Constable family buried there, but all of the people who ever 
owned Constable Hall are buried there. The Lich Gate was uh, design, designed by her uh, grandson, James. And if you're not familiar with what a Lich Gate is, a Lich Gate is an old English tradition and it's a roofed gateway to a cemetery. And the idea with it is that a coffin would be covered while awaiting the arrival of the clergy. The three gravestones that you see on the right of the screen are Mary Eliza's is the first one. Their son, William III is the second one. And then their son, Stevenson is the third one. Now here's a little bit about Mary Eliza that you, you wanna keep in mind, something very important. Her, she was related to the Moore family of New York City. And again, very prominent in the 1800s, uh, Moores and constables intermarried at least on two occasions that we are aware of. This beautiful picture of Constable Hall was done by uh, Susan Moore, who was a, a niece of William Jr. Susan traveled to the hall and she did this sketch in 1831 at the age of 16. And the reason we know that she had to have been there was because of all the detail and the different trees and everything that she included in her sketch. This is one proof of Moors having visited the hall, but we have another connection through the Moors. You might recognize this name, Clement Seymour, not Seymour, Clement C period, more. <laughs> if you do, you know he wrote the very famous Night Before Christmas in 1823. He was a second cousin of Mary Eliza McVickers. And it is believed that he wrote the Night Before Christmas for the Constable children as a Christmas gift that year. There are varying versions and disputes about who actually wrote it, but until 1926, there were letters about his visits at Constable Hall, and there actually was a, there actually was, uh, did have the poem there too. The poem you see on the left of the screen is handwritten by Casimir Constable. He had copied the poem. In Chronicle 3, we'll be talking about what happened at the hall in 1926, and you'll have a better understanding of why such valuable papers may not still be in the hands of the family. The chess set in the upper right-hand corner belonged to Clement Moore, and it was a gift that he gave to the Constable family. And this little chess set, this little red and white chess set can be found in a display case in the drawing room. Lost my cursor here, sorry about that. So then we're gonna talk about John Constable. John Constable was labeled as the gentleman. John was William and Mary Eliza's son, and he was born at Bloomingdale, actually. Her parents owned Bloomingdale at the time in 1813. And it was customary then for women to go home to their mothers when they were having a baby. John became the estate manager as his older brother, William, moved to New York. And he did all the land deals and ran the farm for his mother until her death in 1870. And again, remember, she lived for 49 years after her husband passed away. So in 1870, John became the owner of Constable Hall. He married Julia Pierpont, there's that Pierpont name again, who was a first cousin, and he was 31 years old. They had four children, John and Henry did not survive infancy, but Casimir and James did. In 1857 until 1858, approximately a year and a half, John took his two sons, Casimir and James, to Switzerland, and they spent time being schooled in Switzerland. And upon their return, they took up their camping trips again. And in 1864, John wrote this in a letter from in, in a camping trip. It was December 18th and they were camping up on Constable Point in the Adirondacks. And he wrote to Casimir and said, there is every prospect that each of us will soon have to go 
to work for a living. It's on page 98 in Edith Pilcher's book. We don't have any more information than that, but it doesn't appear that they actually had to go to work when they returned. John owned the Constable Hall from 1870 until 1887. Take a look at this wonderful picture on the right, this white haired man, because I have an anecdote I'm gonna to read to you in a little bit. And this is the image in my mind when I think of this story. John had four siblings. William III is on the left-hand side. William left and went to New York City and became a doctor. And that's why he did not inherit the hall. Um, he had long standing connections with the hall and he, like the rest of the family, loved to hunt. And he did visit very often. He had a summer home in Cooperstown. James, his brother, moved to Philadelphia after he married but he was 39 years old at the time. Uh, we, the, we don't know a lot about James other than he possibly had some health issues, possibly asthma, but he did love the hall and he loved to hunt and he returned. Now Stevenson lived most of his time at the hall. He, he left a little, a few times here and there, but for the most part, he lived there until age 78. He never married stayed there, lived with his mother and his brother. And he was fondly known as Stevie to his family members and Uncle Stevie to his uh, nieces and nephews. Something interesting about Stevenson was in a census, his occupation was listed as hunter. Now, Anna, we don't have a picture of Anna, but Anna loved the outdoors just like everybody else. And she lived at the hall until her marriage at age 49. She married a McVicker. She married Archibald McVicker. Actually, he's buried over in the Constable Cemetery also. And after they were married, they moved to Lions Falls. They did not have any children. So there is the Constable book, the first family, the Adirondacks. And it's a fabulous book that describes the, from 1830 until 1860 when the family uh, camped in the Adirondacks, and it includes letters, it includes grocery lists, it includes pictures, it includes history. It's a fabulous accounting of what went on those 30 years. It documents the trips that John and the siblings made, and it also documents the fact that they took the women with them. The first trip was in, with the women was in 1850, and it was called the First Ladies Expedition. And they camped out for three weeks, in a lean-to. On the right-hand side of the screen are trophies from the hunting trips and other, and we have other hunting items uh, at the hall also. The snowshoe would, was one of the snowshoes that John would have used. Later in life, John became very interested in conservation and a part of that was because where they went in the Adirondacks, Constable Point, became quite crowded with other people. Constable Point was originally called Sand Point, then it was Constable Point, and then it became Antler Point. John became cons very concerned about conservatory uh, con conservation issues then, and actually they ended up moving their campsite from Constable Point because he did not like what he saw happening with the environment. He was a close friend and acquaintance of Clinton Hart Merriam, he was a neighbor, but he was also a very famous biologist. And you might recognize the name of a, a society he, that, that he established, the National Geographic Society. And also he established what we know today as the US Fish and Wildlife Society. Keep your eye on that Pilcher book. John was also a sportsman. So he was a gentleman, he was a hunter, he was a, and, a, and a sportsman. And one of the things that he did was he had the lawn in front of the hall leveled and turned it into a trotting track. And it's believed that the Irishmen who worked on the Black River Canal were the ones that actually did the leveling of the track. John also loved to box and these are John's boxing gloves. They are on display at the hall. And he loved to fence, and this is his fencing equipment also. 
And John shared his love of the boxing and the fencing with the young men in the village. John was also well respected in the community. He was considered a gentleman farmer running an estate farm. He also supported the St. Paul's Church. And the church that you see here is the one for which Mary Eliza donated the land in 1835. And this church is still standing in Seville today. When Casimir passed away, or I'm sorry, when uh, John passed away, Casimir donated the altar cross at, in the church after his father's memory. After John's death, Julia, his wife, lived at Constable Hall for the next 11 years with Casimir and his wife, Jenny. And here's that great story I was gonna tell you about. Um, as an elder, well-respected in the community. And here's, here's a story from a, from a woman who visited uh, the garden when she was just a little girl. Her name was Alice Allen. And this is quoting Alice. One of my earliest memories is connected with the famous old Constable Hall. One summer day, I was taken in my baby cart to visit the garden in the back of the house. I still remember the tall maples on the long driveway, which extends from the village to the hall. And I dearly remember the beauty of the dark evergreens that surround the house and the garden warm with its old world roses. But best of all, I remember John Constable himself. Tall, silver haired and courtly, he came down the garden path. Do you like figs, little girl, he said. I don't know that I had ever seen or heard of one. When I said so, he went into the house and returned with one. I've never forgotten his old fashioned grace and courtliness, end quote. Upon John's death, Casimir inherited the hall. And again, he was, he was one of the four siblings and one of the two who survived. And his picture of him and his brother James is on the left-hand side of the screen. And this is Casimir on the right. He was born in 1845, but he, and he grew up at the hall. And he was an outdoorsman, just like all the rest of them when he was young. He was one of the two, of the two brothers that their father took to the Swiss schools from eight, uh, 1857 to 1858. And he graduated from Harvard in 1865 with an engineering degree. Casimir was a well-known mining engineer and he traveled the United States upgrading steel production for 15 years. Must have been pretty lucrative because in 1880 at the age of 35, he retired. These drawings are Casimir's drawings and they're, they're essentially artistic. The one on the left-hand side is the Constable Estate. That is his signature down at the bottom of the page. And the one on the right is a drawing that he did for a new house in Cooperstown for his brother, William III. Some of you will recognize the name Glimmer Glen. Uh, William had Glimmer Glen built in 1887, but it was destroyed by fire, and then it was rebuilt in 1880. We are unsure if this sketch is the original Glimmer Glen or the 1880 Glimmer Glen. Um, if you go on the uh, Cooperstown website, there's a whole site where it shows the old, older homes, beautiful older homes, and there is actually a picture that is of the sketch of Glimmer Glen. Casimir also was a traveler and a collector. These, this Tuscany chest dates around the year 1300 and uh, he brought it back and it is on display at the hall today. He also loved books and we have all of his engineering books in the library as well as a number of first editions that he, cap that he captured and brought home um, and they are on display also. And I hope your volume is turned up as loud as it can be because I'm going to play something for you and see if you recognize what it is. I hope you can hear that. That is the song from an, an old music box that Casimir brought home in his travels. 
and it sits by the front door at Constable Hall. Can you hear this? I hope so. So Casimir married Jenny in 1887 and then uh, at age 31 and then retired to the hall a few years later. Now Jenny was his cousin, okay? <laughs> there's some stories about Jenny and Casimir and in the Pilcher book, there's a, an account of one of the camping trips that Jenny was on and this was before they were married. And it talks about them flirting with one another and that it seems to be that the relationship was cemented at that time. Uh, family folklore has it that Jenny scared away any and all su possible suitors and that he was left to marry her. You take your pick. This is uh, Casimir's mother, Julia. And again, she lived with them until her death, approximately 11 years after um, his dad died. So Casimir didn't actually take up ownership of the hall until he was 42. And he had a real formal personality and he really liked people to tip their hats to him. And that was his expectation. People working, anybody was expected to tip their hat to Casimir. Some of the people, particularly the men who worked on the estate got a little tired of tipping their hats to uh, Casimir. So they stopped wearing hats to work. At least that's what we were told. Casimir updated the hall and he turned the servants quarters into his workshop with the help of his brother, James, who was a civil engineer and an architect. And on the right hand side, you see his forge in the workshop. Now, Jenny didn't communicate much with the people in the village, but she did allow them to come into the garden uh, in, in the, uh, on Sundays, actually. And Jenny also raised greyhounds. Oops, I'm sorry. This was my continued card. Uh, Casimir died of typhoid fever in New York City in 1905 and Jenny took over ownership of the hall. Casimir was 60 at the time. So these are the folks that inherited the hall and who lived there. We're gonna take a look at how they lived. This is a diorama that is on display at Constable Hall. It's very, very detailed and shows what the, what the estate looked like in approximately in 1870. You can see the hall over here where this green arrow is. And if you look to the left, that is the garden. Remember we said it was in, divided into four quadrants and it's in the shape of the Irish flag as far as we know. Down the road a piece, as they would say, was the farm. And there were actually four uh, cow barns and then there was a fifth barn. And the original entrance to the hall or to to the hall was through the farm and up this way. And that was changed when, during the restoration. Now the room the little building here with the number six on it, that is the wash house, and that's going to be important to us in a few minutes. So this is information about the farm. And in the census of 1870, it tells you what was owned by what was on the farm and actually what was owned by the family, the 200 acres of land, the, the woodland, et cetera. They had 40 milch cows. Milch cows are milk cows. They had other cattle, et cetera. There's the value of them. There's the crops. And please notice the 350 pounds of butter. We think that they probably sold that um, because it would have been really hard to keep 350 pounds of butter and use it throughout the year but it is, it is very possible. The hay, the estimate of the crops, et cetera, their farming equipment, and this is the total that they paid out in wages. So when there were chores to be done, everybody participated. And this picture shows you that some of the women were actually participating in the haying. And this is just one of the beautiful horses on, on the farm being tended by one of the men. 
In some of the other years, uh, beyond 1870, it was listed that they had at least two oxen, they had some mules, and 1,200 pounds of cheese. Now we think that they probably sold some of the cheese to the local cheese factory. Got your volume up? Can you recognize that sound? Cowbell, right? Yes. When Casimir was in Switzerland, he was enamored of the sound of the cowbells. So he brought back cowbells. And this one is actually at Constable Hall today. Well, we're gonna go ahead from you. This is the original entrance to the hall that, was, that took you through the farm to get to the hall. These pillars, were taken apart stone by stone, and they now are at the entrance today that goes off, uh, the, I believe it's the Leiden Road. And the cottage here on the right-hand side, that was Constable Cottage, and it still exists today, uh, but it's privately owned. It's on the other side of Route 26 on West Main Street, and we believe it originally may have been a parish house for the Episcopal minister. Drove by it today, it's painted blue and white. So let's take a look at who lived there around 1870. We had John, I'm sorry, not 1870. We had John, Julia, mother and father. We had Casimir and James, we had their children. Mary Eliza was still alive, so she was 72. We had Stevenson, who was 46, and we had Anna, who was 42. They, uh, Stevenson, of course, didn't marry, and, and Anna didn't marry till age 49. And then these two folks listed were um, servants, because when they did a census back then, if someone was actually living on the, uh, on the property, that person was counted in the census with the family. Our question is, back, and this was 1855, excuse me, where did everybody sleep? Other than the servants sleeping in the servants' quarters, there were only four bedrooms in that house. Somebody must have been sharing. So in 1870, uh, the, they had employees and they're listed over here on the right-hand side, the uh, five employees and it gives their ages and where they came from. It also talks to you about the cattle that they had. They had the Holsteins and please notice Jimbo the bull, but what really kind of caught my eye was Martha, Martha the Holstein. And if you go down to the other herd in volume five in 19, or 1888, there's Martha Catanina and Marthuna. I don't recall that I was named for them, but it kind of struck my heart to see them there. <laughs> and I can just hear my brothers-in-law now, there's gonna be some kind of comment for that. So this is the servants' quarters, which later became the workshop. And the servants lived upstairs. This, is, this door over here is one of the doors to one of the closets. And they had two exits and they were able to access the hall two ways. This arrow points to the lower level where they would go in and they could enter by the kitchen and the, what we know as the Indian room, or there were these stairs on the side and the stairs would take them up to uh, an entryway off the veranda, or the other option might've been the land office. This is pretty interesting. The lady, uh, the green arrow that points to her, that is Elizabeth Newhart. Do you recognize that last name? She was, a great aunt to comedian Bob Newhart. Little piece of interest there. And a long time employee in the late 1800s and into the 1900s. Lizzie, as she was known, grew up on Mohawk Hill and she was Jenny Constable's companion for 30 years. And she traveled with her for those 30 years. When Jenny died in 1905, she left Lizzie $4,000. And in 1905, that was a considerable sum of money. Lizzie never married. She stayed in Utica 
and she was a companion to other people. And over here on the right, remember Squeaky Martis, the man with the squeaky voice, so he was called Squeaky Martis. Well, he was a retired carpenter who lived in the village and he was the caretaker and gardener for 16 years. When he died, or when Jenny died, she willed him $2,000. So let's talk about how they did things. Let's talk about food preservation, first of all. No refrigerators showed up in Constable Hall, uh, Constableville or at the hall until about 1925. Um, they had the ice house back in the 1840s, but you didn't have good sources of ice all year long necessarily. So your options were to eat fresh food, to dry or can it, to salt it, to cool it by ice or in the root cellar, freeze it outside in the winter, or to process it. And one of the things they did do, obviously because of the 350 pounds of butter, they did make butter at the hall. So these, this is on the right-hand side here. This is the very simple process of making butter. You cool it, you skim it, you squeeze it. Let me tell you what they really had to do. First, you put the milk in a shallow pan to let it separate. This is before homogenization. And you put it in a cool place. About a half a day or 12 hours later, you skim the thickened cream off the top and you put it into a collection pan. Now you do this for several days. You collect this and you put it in the pan. That lets it ripen and gives it and improves the flavor. Then you put it in the churn and you churn it for 30 minutes. Then you separate the butter and the buttermilk by squeezing out the buttermilk. Then you salt the butter for preservation. Now you got to clean the churn. So you use salt, boiling water, and hopefully you have a sunny day where you can dry the churn outside. And then you store the butter in the ice house or you sell it. Oftentimes they used stamps, especially for, you know, it's certain meals of the day and especially when there was company and these are butter stamps and actually there are a number of butter stamps on the display at Constable Hall and this is what they look like over here and so you would you would warm the butter not enough so it was melted but you would warm it and then you would stamp it with the stamp and then you would serve it so part of the process of making butter was churning it and there were a couple different ways this was done there was the treadmill churn uh, and there was the barrel churn. Now this, in the upper right-hand corner, this is a, a treadmill churn that is on display at Constable Hall. It's a, not an original piece, it was something that was donated. The dog churn, which you see in the lower left-hand corner, was inherited, uh, uh, was, excuse me, uh, invented by H.M. Childs of Utica in 1871. And again, no animals were harmed in, in making of, of this webinar. Uh, it, dogs and goats were used on treadmills to do various things around the farm, but churning butter was not one of them. So what the hall had was a barrel churn. And this was considered a modern convenience. And we're gonna show you how the barrel churn actually worked. A little more humane than using the dogs, right? So the hall produced somewhere between 500 and 1,000 pounds of butter every year. And just to put that into perspective, it takes approximately 30 pounds of milk to make one pound of butter. Makes you kind of grateful for the dairy section, doesn't it? So this is the laundry house. And it also served as quarters for the coachman when, if he needed a place to sleep. So the laundry house actually had a hedge around it and the clothesline was inside the hedge so that would hide the clothing so that people couldn't see it when it was hanging out to dry. So be grateful for those washing machines, folks, because here's why you did the laundry back then. You made your soap from animal fat or from, uh, and from ashes from lye because there wasn't any soap around until the late 1800s. Then you would use the yoke, put it around your neck, have your pails hanging on it, you'd go and you'd get your water, you'd bring it up to the house,
put it in the kettles and heat it up. You needed to get it to boiling. You would soap and soak the clothing. And then if you couldn't get things clean enough, you would use the plunger over here on the right hand side. So that is a plunger agitator. So you would use it to do this, to agitate the clothing to help you do the laundry. If there were tough stains, then you went to the washboard and you would to rub out the dirt. And I read a great account about a woman who said she couldn't wait when she was called away from the washboard because her knuckles and her hands were raw from scraping up and down the washboard trying to get everything so clean. Now, once you got all of this done, then you had to wring the water out. So there were two kinds of wringers at the hall. Let's take a look at this one. That's probably for some of the finer fabrics. Now we'll take a look at the bigger one and listen. I don't understand why, <laughs> why all the buttons and you know, decorations and whatever were not broken off <laughs> going through those ringers. Um, this website down here, oldandinteresting.com, is great to go into and you can look at and see the whole process of doing the laundry. They would start on Monday and do laundry throughout the week with hopes that by Saturday, it was all done, washed, ironed, and so Sunday would be a day of rest. So speaking of ironing, these were these are a couple of the irons at the hall. The one on the left looks like it probably was used for some pretty heavy fabrics because it's a pretty heavy iron. And if, what you would do is you would heat the iron on the stove or in the coals, and then you would iron your fabric as long as the iron stayed hot. And then you would repeat the process again. You would heat it, you would go iron, you'd go back and forth, back and forth. And that's a very heavy iron. The one on the right hand side has a trivet underneath it and there's a metal plate and then above that there's a soapstone and the soapstone would stay very very hot and keep the metal plate hot so that you would probably be able to iron a little bit longer. It was still a tough process. Doing laundry was an arduous task back then. Um, so grateful for our automatic washers and dryers today. So what did they do at the hall other than, you know, when the servants were doing the laundry and what have you? Well, there was a lot of sitting going on. <laughs> and these are chairs at the front portico of the hall. And the picture actually of Casimir and Jenny and Julia um, sitting, uh, they are sitting exactly where those chairs are located, right in front of the windows at, at the dining room. This picture over here is a play and we don't have a lot of information about it. We just know that a troop of people were performing a play on the front yard of the hall. Actually, they're right in front of the land office. And as, as, as we've been looking at this picture, we've been trying to speculate, okay, what was going on here? Um, the women almost look like they've got their hands together, almost begging or praying for something. This man back here and it has a, a rifle or a, a weapon of some sort, and he's getting ready to shoot at something. I thought he might've been firing at the hat up here and that this man was going to put the stick down when it was time to, to do that. But uh, Peter and Jennifer each had different ideas too. So as you look at this, uh, you'll probably be making up your own story also. And this is what the hall looked like from the front before lawn mowers. The picture on the left is what the lawn would have uh, appeared. And it's actually, there is a letter uh, that indicates that they actually picked strawberries on the front lawn. There also was um, a bowling green and that was over closer to the garden. And the gravel paths that go around the, uh, went around the hall still do today. Um, 
there it was a cutting garden, apparently a cutting garden down on the front yard. And that's what we think that this lady is doing is at the cutting garden, uh, snipping a bouquet for herself. We don't think this is a relative. Uh, she does have a basket on, on the left-hand side and she is apparently picking the flowers. So one last little tidbit of what happened at the hall. Every morning when Mary Eliza was alive, the coachman, after he got done sleeping in the laundry house, would bring her horse around and she would take her constitutional on the trotting track. And that folks was life at Constable Hall in the 1800s. You saw our mission last time and add to that preservation, all about preserving history. Uh, and uh, we welcome your support in any way you feel like you'd like to honor us whether it's a visit once we're open again, 2021, we hope, uh, become a member, a lifetime, year member, whatever. We would love to have you be a member or if you want to volunteer. I actually have a friend in Florida who can't wait to get up here and work in the gardens next spring. You can visit us at uh, our website, constablehall.org, and you can find us on Facebook. Jennifer, are you back? I'm back. I never yeah. left. Thank you very much. That was fun. Yeah. Was yeah. Fun. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I know everybody's probably waiting to get in on this uh, uh, little quiz. Yes. Uh, yes. I have my... If you do have questions or comments, uh, put them in the chat. Let's do the quiz and then we'll get back to your questions. So as I mentioned, uh, the seventh generation from William Constable Jr. donated the money for us to be able to offer you this really special prize for uh, the quiz tonight. Uh, the books are available uh, through the gift shop. There are a couple different ways that you can do that. If you don't happen to win tonight, you can uh, put a message on Facebook if you'd like and um, it will get to the correct person. You would have to pay for postage and um, tax, of course, and the book. The books are 25. You could send an email to the hall, which is constablehall at rocket.com. Or I'm gonna give you a secret phone number here and it's not Jen's. You can call Mary at area code 315. 397-2771. Again, that's 315-397-2771 and ask for Mary. That's my sister. Okay, the way we're gonna do the quiz this time is a little different than the last time because some people said they had trouble typing the words fast enough to get them in. They knew the answer, but they couldn't do it. So what we're gonna do tonight is we're going to have you call Jennifer. And then the first correct answer th that she gets, the first phone call with the correct answer that she gets will be the person who will get the Constable Hall book. We cut it down to three questions tonight, just because there was a, a, a little heftier price. And um, her phone number is right up here on the screen. And it's 315-785-2300. Nine, two. Let's give you a minute to get used to that. And again, it's 315-78. Is your phone ringing already? No. Oh, no. <laughs> not that's, yet, a good, huh? that's a good reminder. Don't, let's not call until uh, Marty's done with the question. Yeah, let, let me finish reading the question first, okay? <laughs> and let, I'm going to tell you this. I'm going to put myself on mute because I think there'll be feedback. Okay. With the phone ringing and talking and things like that. So but then you'll come back and you'll tell us who it was so Absolutely. that we, so that yep. we know. And, yep. um, and I know you know the answers. I got the answer. Yeah, we, we went over this the other day, folks. <laughs> and it's not cheating. Yeah. So again, Jennifer's number is 315-785-2392. So is everybody ready? Raise your hand. <laughs> okay. Question number one. I saw three people raise their hands. <laughs> okay. 
What was the name of William Constable Sr.'s New York City summer home that Mary Eliza's father, John McVicker, purchased? You got one. She muted herself, so you're just gonna have to listen to me. I can sing, I can hum. <laughs> that was a quick phone call. Somebody had it dialed in already. I got a call it? from Bob Petke and he had the correct answer. He was the first one to call in, so thank and you. And where, where's he from? Let's see, Bob, where are you from? Oswego, no, you said Oswego, Illinois? All right, that's great. Now, do I have, um, stay on the line. I'm gonna put myself on mute for a second and uh, I'll get your address. Okay, hold on for one second. Okay, so the answer to that, for anybody who wasn't quite sure, the answer was Bloomingdale. Remember the house, the Bloomingdale house that was in Midtown Manhattan? that belonged to William Constable and he used it as his summer home originally. And then he sold it to John McVicker and John, that's where the McVickers lived. And actually um, children were born there because that was when they went back to be with their mothers. But there are still two more chances, folks. Jennifer's writing as fast as she can. This may not be the ideal way to do this, but it was better than having people feel like they had to write something down and, and couldn't do it fast enough. Okay. I'm back. All righty. So he was in Illinois. He was in Oswego, Illinois. Oh, that's really cool. I have no idea where that is. Yep. Yep. Okay, are we ready for question two? And again, her number is 315-785-2392. You only get to win once. <laughs> okay, question number two. What is a vulgar fraction? What is a vulgar fraction? Ah, oh, that was quick. I love it that you're listening. This is so awesome. I don't know if people are taking notes. I have Renee and she says it's a common fraction. Right. That's right. What are the two parts of the common fraction? <laughs> Does she remember that? She got it, the numerator <laughs> and the denominator. Oh, are you a math teacher, Renee? <laughs> oh, she's a nurse. <laughs> <laughs> okay, all right. They deal with fractions, right. You gonna get her address then? Okay. So the common fraction, if you recall, um, that was that lesson of Mary Eliza's that showed, and it said it was reduction of the vulgar fractions at the top. And that was actually one of her lessons out of her lesson book. I hope you like doing it this way, as opposed to trying to type in. I, I'm finding this to be kind of fun. All right, are we ready for I feel, like, I feel like a DJ. <laughs> Punching those buttons, taking those names and numbers. All right, last question. Okay, this is for book number three. What gift from Clement Moore will you find at Constable Hall? What? Well, there you go. <laughs> and that was a quickie also. And just a reminder, if you want one of the Constable books, you can get it by messaging us on Facebook. Send an email to the hall and they'll get it to Mary. And that is constablehall at rocket.com. Or you can call Mary, 315-397-2771. And for anybody who's looking in or, or listening in or anybody who's born in the North Country, what a great... Christmas gift, okay? Uh, hits the spot and plus it's a great history lesson for New York State. And who did we have, Jennifer? We had Susie, I hope I'm saying this right, Arago from Port Leiden. Ah, okay, Susie. And what was her answer? 
The chess set. Yes, the chess set. The little red and white chess set in the drawing room. So that's great. We had we had Illinois, Austin, Texas, and then we had Fort Leiden. Oh my gosh, that is awesome. That is great. Uh, one one thing we we did look to see the books are uh, not sold on Amazon. They are out. We, they don't know when they will be back in. So if you are interested in purchasing a book, one of those three methods, uh, email us or email us at, at constablehall at rocketmail.com, uh, do the Facebook or call Mary at that 315-397-2771. I kind of feel like Jerry Lewis and the, <laughs> the telethon there. But. We have a question from Kate Murray. Oh, geez, that's my she daughter. Wants your, she wants to do your best Martha the Cow impression. Uh, <laughs> I'll save it if you come up this weekend. Uh, there you go. <laughs> uh, there's a question from Pam. Uh, Marty, who did, uh, who did and how did they do the survey on the one photo you showed? Also, what happened to the Bloomingdale house? Uh, Bloomingdale House. Well, we've got Peter here and um, LJ. So he, we're going to get cozy. Uh, sorry, the question, uh, Jennifer, t ask me the question again, please. Okay. Who did and how did they do the survey on the one photo you showed? What did they do the survey? I Are think they talk about the census, Pam. Was that the sketch that um, Casimir did? Uh, she says, no, it was the land survey. A land survey? Where's the chat window? I don't know. Uh, the sketch. She means the sketch. This, the, I, I think you mean the sketch of uh, uh, the Constable Estate? Yes. yes. Okay. So uh, that was uh, the the sketch of the Constable Estate that Marty showed. It was on the left side of the slide, and it was done by Casimir. He did it for an insurance policy that was submitted at that time, and uh, he he did survey around the estate. We have other other uh, drawings of his that were not included that were quite de uh, done in a very detailed manner. He apparently had surveying equipment. He had. Uh, he could do the chains and links. So from his amateur surveying uh, work, he drew up that uh, map of the Constable Estate. And it was to document how many barns there were and how big they were. And it was for the insurance policy at that time. And remember, he, Pam, he was an engineer. So that would have been right up his alley. And what was the other question about? Um, what happened to the Bloomingdale House? The one in New York City. The, the, the Bloomingdale House, as best we know, uh, was it was around 85th Street on the west side of Manhattan. Uh, it shows up uh, on the very early maps of Manhattan, so you can see exactly where it was. Uh, there was a road that came out of Manhattan that was called Bloomingdale Road mm -hmm. uh, that went up to the little village of Bloomingdale. Uh, the house itself, uh, if you overlay the grid system that was put in uh, around um, uh, 1810 on Manhattan, it comes around 85th Street, 80, between 85th and 87th. Um, and uh, so eventually the city uh, grew from the tip of Manhattan and overwhelmed all of these houses and turned into commercial districts. So we're guessing around 1860 is when that house was taken down and was turned into just uh, uh, commercial uh, blocks. Uh, and if you can go to that exact location today with uh, Google uh, Street View and you see a big old store there, uh, there's nothing there. But at the time from the old maps, it would have been on the crest of, the, of Manhattan and it would have uh, looked over the Hudson River. It really was quite a gorgeous location. No, there were so many of them. Same thing with uh, Cooperstown, too. A lot of those beautiful homes are gone. Um, Kate wants to know if there's any relation to the, the, the retail, the Bloomingdale's. That is a good question. I don't know. Uh, that maybe is the case. The village of Bloomingdale on Manhattan uh, was in place during 
the Revolutionary War, the 1770s. So it's at least it goes that Bloomingdale as a village and as a road goes back to at least 1760. Whether that has any connection to the Bloomingdale store that we know and love in Manhattan, uh, I don't know. Maybe. But Peter knows everything else. <laughs> no, I don't know. No. <laughs> oh, and does anybody recognize Peter's shirt? Don't you know how clean it is? Does anybody recognize this cleaned, shirt? Cleaned, cleaned, pressed, and uh, yeah, that was Peter's shirt that went through <laughs> the laundry. Oh dear, I'm surprised no no uh, shirts were harmed in the filming. Yeah. Well, actually, it was. So I'm missing a button. <laughs> <laughs> great, that's great. I don't see any more questions, but I would I would say. Um, what are we going to talk about in the next webinar? Oh, the next one is the one that's uh, especially near and dear to my heart. The next one will talk about the owners in the 1900s. And that is my grandfather, John Pierpont Constable Sr., my grandmother, Wanda McCallis Constable, and my father, John Pierpont Constable, who held title until 1947. And we'll be talking about their chi uh, the childhood. And the wonderful thing about this was I had a chance to actually interview my father and his two sisters before they passed away. And so I have their personal stories of what they recalled. And, and uh, actually my cousins have been helping me also with this. And we've been digging in and finding just wonderful pictures and uh, you know, they say stories, a little more lore and legend, but I think some of this is a little more truthful than uh, some of the other things that have been passed down over the years. So yeah. that's what webinar three will be. It's going to take you to the 1900s until the family no longer owned Constable Hall. Okay. I have a, there's a couple of um, comments saying thank you uh, and that, you know, the gardens are beautiful, but there is a question from Marjorie Capron. Are any of the current garden plants from the original seed? No, mm. no, it was believed at one time that there possibly were. And also um, I mentioned the last time we thought that maybe there was blackthorn hedge, but there is not, it's buckthorn, um, but there are no uh, original plantings. But the, the, the last planting that we, we think was there uh, were old tea roses uh, that were referenced in uh, um, meeting notes in the 1950s. So we believe they were there in the 1950s, maybe the 1960s, but uh, we believe they faded out uh, or no, we don't have anybody who can identify them anymore. So that's probably the last planting that uh, was original going back to the 1820s. Okay. Um, Shelly Peterson would like to know how many servants worked in the hall? Anywhere from two to seven. Yeah, uh, we don't know, Shelley. Uh, that's a good question, and we've wondered about that. It seems to have, uh, uh, you, you have on-premise servants, and they will show up in the censuses. So we have looked at literally every sentence, every uh, decennial census, uh, right, starting in 1820, to try to determine, you know, who, who was there and how many. And it varied between two and about seven uh, during all of those years. Uh, but we believe that uh, there more and more people walked uh, from the village. Uh, George Martis that Marty talked about, he, he had a house uh, over on West Main. So he just walked over to the hall. Uh, so I'm sure there were uh, quite a few number of people who uh, just walked from the village. So uh, they were servants, employees. It's kind of a, a murky boundary. So I guess if you wanted to put a, a, a range on it, anywhere between uh, uh, two and ten at various times. All right. Many other questions. If not, I think, oh, there's a message. No, just, um, no, yeah. Okay. I would thank everybody for joining us tonight. Uh, pay attention to your emails and social media as to when we schedule the next one. And I would bid every well a, a, a good good evening and, and see you next time. Martha, would you mind staying out with me when, when we're done? I will hang around with you. Right. Sure Thank thing. You. Good Thanks, night, everybody. everyone. Thank you. Got lots of thank yous.
Oh, good. Yeah. This was fun. Yeah. It was a good one. Yeah. I also noticed on our registration, I don't know why this surprises me, but there was somebody that registered from Boonville, Alabama. I don't know if they were on tonight or not, but that's that's very... Uh... Well, you said something about Alabama. Yeah. Oh, the... you, me you mentioned somebody was calling, was on there from Alabama. So right. I wonder if that was who it was. I don't know. Oh, there's one question that came in and I didn't see it. Have you ever slept at the hall? Pam Clark wants to know. No. No. No, Dad, uh, Dad's family was the last ones that did. And then once it became a... Uh, and, and historic home, of course, it was just there for tours and what have you. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. And it's kind of cold there this time of the year. Yeah. Thanks, everybody. I'm going to stop recording.